Now I'd like to introduce today's symposium panel moderator, my colleague, Maya Walton. Maya is the Assistant Director for Research and Fellowships at the University of Hawaii Sea Grant. Let's give a warm hafade and aloha to Maya. Thank you so much, Phil, for that warm gum. Mahalo, thank you to everyone who logged in early. We're so excited to get this panel started this morning. Aloha, half a day, good morning, good afternoon, um, and welcome back again to the 2021 University of Guam Conference on Island Sustainability. Like Phil said, my name is Maya Walton. I work at Hawaii Sea Grant, and we have a great panel this morning, great panelists. Um, the panel is titled Sea Grant in the Islands. So in a moment, we'll invite the panelists and have them introduce themselves to all of you. But um, before we turn it over to our panelists, I have a couple of quick reminders um, and also a quick thank you. So I'd like to start off with a thank you to the behind the scenes team. I know there are many, many folks working behind the scenes today to make this virtual conference happen. So thank you so much to all of you for working hard um, to help us connect across um, different islands, different states, even different countries. Uh, and now for the reminders, a quick reminder that we will be recording the webinar today and the recording will be made available on the Conference for Island Sustainability website. Um, and then a second reminder, um, while the panelists share during the moderated panel, we do welcome questions from the audience. So as you have questions, please do submit them in the chat box. And we hope to get to your questions um, towards the end of today's panel. So um, now for some framing, framing for our conversation today. Um, the title of the panel is Sea Grant in the Islands. And today our panelists will be sharing how Sea Grant programs and the Sea Grant network has been working in support of island communities, how island communities serve as sentinels for future impacts and also as models for sustainability and re resilience, and how Sea Grant's work for more than 50 years has laid the groundwork for the United Nations decade of ocean science for sustainable development. The UN Ocean Decade provides a once in a lifetime opportunity to create a new foundation across the science policy interface. So many of our panelists will be talking about that interface this morning. Um, and the UN Ocean Decade will require engagement of many different stakeholders. This is something that Sea Grant does very well. Um, and the engagement of, this, of these stakeholders is to create new ideas, solutions, partnerships, and applications. So we'll be hearing about those partnerships and those stakeholder engagement examples um, later on in today's panel. So let's bring our panelists into the Zoom room, so to speak. Uh, so I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and to also share how Sea Grant Island programs or the larger Sea Grant network helps to support ocean and coastal sustainability and resilience. Fran, can I have you introduce yourself first? Yeah, sure. Um, half a day, everyone, and good day to those in different time zones. I'm Fran Castro, the Associate Director um, with the University of Guam Sea Grant. So I've been with Guam Sea Grant for uh, about three years now and when I started it was just Austin and I and maybe a couple of extension staff, but now the program has grown in so many levels, but we're still the youngest and um, smallest program in the Sea Grant family of 34. Um, but we're striving to get to that institutional status um, so we can be on the same level as other Sea Grant programs and in doing so we'll be able to bring more resources for research and extension and education. Um, here on Guam and in the region. So we have two uh, focus areas here at Guam Sea Grant, uh, which are healthy coastal ecosystems and environmental literacy and workforce development. And so while we're small, we're doing um, a lot of things um, within communities and for communities. Um, Guam Sea Grant, like any other program, Sea Grant program offers research uh, funding through a competition for faculty and nonprofit organizations in the region. Um, we are also working to restore one watershed at a time with the Guam uh, Restoration of Watersheds or GROW. Um, our Sea Grant program sponsors traditional navigational courses uh, to align with National Sea Grant's vision uh, to incorporate traditional local knowledge into the work that we do. 
Um, and as of recent, we've been uh, exploring opportunities uh, to bring backyard aquaponics um, to communities in Guam, uh, especially at a time when food security is critical and, and the world is vulnerable to food shortages, right? Um, the other thing that we do is we work with the Navy uh, through their Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit to monitor sea turtles uh, on military bases in Guam and within the Mariana Islands range complex. So being in an island setting, we, we definitely have challenges, but a lot of opportunities uh, and we need a plan for coastal uh, sustainability and, and the uh, face of climate change and sea level rise, uh, which we're in the forefront of. Um, and we have be just become more vulnerable uh, than ever. And so the work we engage in to protect and manage our reefs and our resources um, is critical because we as islanders um, have a way of life uh, in which we rely on the land and, and the sea to sustain us. And so the threats um, before us uh, require us to do more, but um, we can't do it alone. We need to create partnerships, collaborate with our leaders, um, our citizens and our volunteers and our colleagues even. Um, <clears throat> so now more than ever, uh, we need to engage um, our communities and build resilience so they are able to um, adapt uh, in these changing times. So as Craig McLean, uh, mentioned in his talk yesterday, we need to restructure our manner of living. Uh, and the work that we do here at Guam Sea Grant, um, especially our local led initiatives, such as the Guam Green Growth, uh, Growth Framework um, will help us bring towards a sustainable future. So that's sort of in a nutshell of what we do here on Guam, but uh, I'm sure there's a lot more. <laughs> Thank you, Fran. It sounds like you guys are engaged in lots of awesome projects at Guam Sea Grant. Let's move next to the director of Puerto Rico Sea Grant, Ruperto Chaparro. Can we have you introduce yourself to the panel this morning? Sure. Yes, I am Ruperto Chaparro. I am the director of Puerto Rico Sea Grant. And Sea Grant in Puerto Rico is very important because as you know, we have been having financial problems for a long time, and we are really the primary institution to offer marine extension, marine education, and, and res applied research on coastal and marine resources. Uh, in Puerto Rico, for example, we have a tradition and cultural uh, social characteristics that are very important to maintain the resilience of Puerto Ricans to extreme events. For example, these traditions have been passed through generations, uh, through generation, and, and this has made us very resilient since people learn how to live with hurricanes, how to live with floods, uh, with waves and tsunamis, all those are uh, natural events that happen on our coast. And Sigran has been very, uh, let me see how, what word I have to use, very careful not to disturb our culture and our tradition and with the problems that we're having, and I'm sure all the islands are suffering from gentrification, which is really a displacement of the local culture and the local traditions and uses of the coast. We have been dealing with our students, with our coastal communities, with our NGOs to keep those traditions, to keep people learning about our coastal and marine ecosystems, because if you don't know those resources, you won't care to make them or develop them in a sustainable way. So SIGRAN is very important in Puerto Rico since we are getting the funding to take all this information into our coastal and marine communities. And people are really very grateful and use SIGRAN as the primary source of information because our information is based on science. So 
I think I want to, to really use the opportunity to thank uh, John, uh, the director of uh, our national office, uh, because when Darren and I talked to him about the differences that Ireland have to other programs, he was very uh, understanding and he told us, yes, we can have uh, an area for Ireland uh, in Seagrant. And this has developed a big collaboration among Seagrant Hawaii, Seagrant Puerto Rico, Seagrant Guam. And at the beginning, we also had Florida, which is not an island, but which have a similar uh, climate. Thank you, Chapa. I love this point you bring up about uh, the importance of cultural knowledge and traditional knowledge in forming some of the foundation for the resilience that we see in island communities. Thanks for that thought. Let's move to the director of Hawaii Sea Grant, um, Darren Lerner. Aloha, everybody. Thank you, Maya. Uh, half a day. Uh, it's, uh, I, I wish I could say it's great to see everybody, but this virtual experience that we're all having, we, I can't see the whole audience. And I, I know, like all of you, I look forward to the day where we can all actually be together for this fantastic conference. I've attended a few, uh, and I want to thank the conference organizers and the Center for Island Sustainability, Guam Sea Grant, uh, they all just do an incredible job at putting together these conferences. And, and, um, and so thank you for that. And as Maya said, my name is Darren Lerner and uh, I do serve, I have the privilege to serve really as the director for our Sea Grant program at the University of Hawaii. Uh, I started there in 2007 as the associate director and had the opportunity to apply and, and end up as the, as the director starting in 2014. Um, our program began in 1968 as a project and four years later uh, became an institutional program. And you heard uh, Fran mention that earlier that that's the stage at which Guam is now seeking uh, so it is a process of programmatic maturation, if you will, that all programs have gone through to move from project status to institutional status. And, um, and it's something that we're all uh, very supportive and, and looking forward to Guam uh, um, becoming. So um, a lot has been mentioned, and of course, we're all Sea Grant programs, so we have this commonality. And, and I've been thinking as my colleagues have been speaking about the things that I can highlight. I think one of the important things to highlight about Sea Grant and our Sea Grant programs, and my colleagues will tell me if I'm misrepresenting them, but I'm, I'm fairly sure I'm not, uh, is at the, the very basis of everything we do is really all about people and communities. Our focus is, is very significantly on, on people. In fact, I, I wonder what we would do if it, if it weren't for that. And that is to say whether we're talking about our support in our various focus areas that were mentioned like healthy coastal ecosystems or sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, work in um, growing our communities to be more resilient and our economies uh, and our work in environmental literacy and workforce development, that all of that revol revolves around the supporting people and communities and building resilience for these people and communities. Now for the programs here, uh, represented by myself and Fran and, and, and Chapa, um, they're island communities. Um, and I think even more so for island communities than our, than our brothers and sisters on the, the US continent, um, this term coastal, it means everything. Um, and there's a certain, there's a certain increased vulnerability for islands and for the people who live on islands, um, not only because we're relatively smaller than that continental mass, but, um, but because we're also quite remote. And so when things happen, we have various hazards and things happen, we can't just turn to the people we share a land border with and say, oh, can you come on over and help us out, right? It takes a lot more logistics when, when those things occur. And as I mentioned, really everything is coastal when you're looking at an island. Um, and I think one of the other things uh, I, to add to 
um, some of this conversation or understanding of Sea Grant and how we work. Uh, we have a history in the early days. I mentioned we started in 1968 and the various programs start at different times uh, with quite a number in the late 60s and into the early and mid 70s. And for those decades going even into the 80s, um, our name, Sea Grant, we were often thought of as Fish Grant. We did quite a bit in aquaculture and fisheries. We did a few other things, but so much was focused in aquaculture and fisheries. We were still in the same functional areas of research and extension and education as we are today, but I guess with a smaller subset of focus areas. And so there was this common kind of uh, catch-all to call us Fish Grant. And really, as we approached the mid to late 90s, and certainly by 2000, um, all of our programs working so hard to solve the problems that we face in our oceans and on our coasts, there was, there was kind of an epiphany where we all looked at what we were doing and we're there, we're busy working in those oceans and we're standing on those coastal and trying to figure out how to solve these problems, working in the ocean to do so. And it was a realization that so many of the problems that we face really are coming from the, our behavior and our policies on land. So it was almost a literal about face. You're standing as you can, I hope all imagine with your feet in the sand, you're looking at the ocean thinking, how do we solve these problems? And we finally kind of turned around and we looked up at the top of our mountains, especially here in the islands. And we said, oh, the problems are what we're doing on land. It's how we build our infrastructure, where we build our infrastructure, um, all the different ways in which we help protect people, right? Like flood control and these various other issues um, related in, in large part to our infrastructure. And from that point um, forward, we saw a big change. And so, and that's reflected by some of these uh, kind of newer focus areas uh, and by the deep engagement of all of our programs with people and communities all across, of course, our islands as the focus is today, but really across every state in which we have a Sea Grant program. So thank you. Thanks, Darren. That's a really good point that many of the island Sea Grant programs are working on research, extension, education at this land to sea um, interface, that land to sea connection. I like that a lot. Um, last but not least, let's have the director of NOAA's National Sea Grant Office, Jonathan Pennock, um, please introduce himself to the panel and the audience this morning. Uh, thank you, Maya, and Hufade, aloha, uh, and greetings from early evening on the East Coast. Um, I'm coming from my uh, nice cottage on the northern uh, Chesapeake Bay where uh, fortunate enough, my wife and I are here and we've been isolating here for over a year now. So um, it's a little different than the normal Washington DC, Silver Spring, Maryland uh, headquarters building that um, we'll get back to at some point in the coming months. Um, so it's an honor to be joining um, all of you today. Um, yesterday was just such a great introduction to island sustainability, to, um, to the conference and to the um, work uh, that a lot of you do. And I know uh, hopefully many of you participated in that um, and heard the two keynotes. I mean, Nicole's was just so um, inspiring. It, uh, you know, and I think the bottom line is while uh, there are many challenges that we face in the coastal zone broadly, but particularly on the islands, um, the oceans inspire passion. Um, in people and that passion and young people like Nicole and hopefully a number of you who are um, on this uh, at the conference today uh, to uh, do great things. I feel great about the future, although obviously we do have challenges. Um, I'm lifted up by the passion of, I'll just say the peoples of the island. We represent uh, Darren and Chapa and, and Fran, uh, the three programs. Uh, that we have that are island programs within Sea Grant, but it's broader than that. We serve um, uh, Micro Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, the Virgin Islands. It, it goes beyond that, although they're only the three uh, core programs to date. Um, and the work towards sustainability that um, all three of my colleagues uh, spoke about um, is very important. 
we're, today we're linking um, Sea Grant to the decade um, that Craig introduced, uh, Craig McLean introduced yesterday, the, the UN decade, and um, the work that's going on there. And what I would say is the ocean decade, it sort of is Sea Grant. Right, it is, you've already heard a little bit about uh, that, I think as we go through the evening, hopefully we'll be able to tell you more if you're not familiar uh, with it. But um, what the decade is, you know, is looking to do, which is to engage with people at the local level uh, to bring all the power we need to solve some of the critical problems that the oceans and our globe face. Um, it is about you. It is about Sea Grant. Um, and the way Sea Grant works, I think, is a powerful model that is very consistent um, with, the, with the ocean decade. Um, sea Grant's been around for over 50 years now um, as a federal state or federal territory um, partnership. Um, we are proud of that, and we'll talk a little bit later about how we work. You've already heard a, a few of those words, but we really work with coastal communities, as, as Darren and uh, Chapa said in particular, and we work um, with those communities to empower and inspire them to do their, their work. Um, we have a, uh, certainly engaged the university communities, the power of the research and the extension um, in, in our universities, um, but it really is about the people and it is about bringing science when needed um, and bringing techniques to bear. Um, and so I'm looking forward to uh, this evening and the rest of the conference. Um, and Maya, I think I'll just hand it back to you uh, now. Um, I will say, I, I probably got too deep into it. I, for myself, um, I am Jonathan Pennock. Maya introduced me, so I was like, okay, I'm not gonna do, do that again. Um, I've only been at the national office for just under five years uh, now. I was in academia for much of my career. Um, I'm an estrogen nutrient biogeochemist, if you want to get uh, any more boring than that, a phytoplankton ecologist, and work, but I've always worked on the impacts of humans um, on our coastal zone. And um, I was involved, I, I saw a comment in the chat box of um, someone, I've, I'm not looking at it right now, about being with Sea Grant back in the 80s. And that was me. I was a student who was funded on my PhD research through Sea Grant. Um, I carried that on to work my work in academia. Um, uh, at times got some funding through Sea Grant, at other times served on boards and other things, um, helping the communities in the areas that I was um, working. And um, most recently before I came here, I was at the University of New Hampshire where um, I was uh, the C state Sea Grant director, the same position that uh, Chapa Darren have in um, Austin. And, um, was at that for 12 or 13 years um, and then made the move sort of later in my career to do some governmental service. But it's really been the passion of being on the water, on the coasts uh, and involved with Sea Grant um, and, and committed to the way in which Sea Grant works that brought me to where I am today. So Maya, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, take us forward. Thanks, John. Um, this is so funny because the first question I'm going to send right back to you. Um, I see in the audience we have folks who are very familiar with Sea Grant, maybe folks who have heard um, about Sea Grant programs for the very first time this morning. Um, and from the directors, from the associate directors, from you as the director of the National Sea Grant Office, we heard a little bit about the Sea Grant model um, research, extension, and education. For folks who are um, newer to the Sea Grant model, can you give us a short explanation of what Sea Grant does and what we do well? Sure, I'd be happy to, and, and thank you for that question. Um, most of you probably know Sea Grant through the three programs that are being represented here. I mean, certainly there are a number of you in uh, the continental U.S. and around the world who may not be as familiar, but um, as Fran, I think, said, the, the folks here at the state program level are representing three of our 34 programs. Um, 33 of those programs are representing all of the states, um, uh, the territories represented here, and but the coastal states and Great Lakes states in the US. We have two states uh, for historical reasons that have two Sea Grant programs, California and Massachusetts. Uh, you could guess uh, based on the presence of some longtime major um, 
research, academic research um, programs, uh, why that may have happened through time. Uh, one of our programs, which actually just came through to coherent area status, which is uh, the, one of the earlier status um, levels for Sea Grant, is the National Sea Grant Law Center uh, based in uh, Mississippi. And so we have a, a special capacity there that is that serves and sort of pulls together uh, the uh, legal framework for policy decisions and other things for our network and is in and around a lot of the programs in the network, but not all of them. Um, the, the key similarities, I, I think, has already been mentioned, but the, the Sea Grant model, if you've been around Sea Grant long enough, you, you hear the Sea Grant model. Well, what just what is the Sea Grant model? And it really is based on land grant. Um, which is at a lot of the major universities in, in every state um, in, in the US, uh, which is combining research, extension, and education. Um, we often talk about uh, extension and use the word engagement because it's really a two-way process. Um, it would be fishermen, it would be uh, city planners, it would be business people who have questions, they need research done that there isn't really a literature for. Um, and they work through our extension agents often to get uh, ultimately engage researchers around our network or in the individual states uh, to really deliver on new social science, new economics, new um, uh, physical and biological sciences, chemical sciences to bring answers back about certain things. It could be uh, sort of fishing gear engineering to uh, try to deal with the fact that we have limitations on catch of certain species and not. It's wide, wide ranging, but everything falls back into that model. And then we it go, comes out the other side in the ex, uh, education work. And we have um, education that we often call K to gray. There's a significant um, uh, kindergarten to 12th grade uh, engagement uh, there is a lot going on at the universities with research assistantships, fellowships, and other things, all, some of those at the national level and the state level. And then also for uh, those who are in the workforce um, and or retired who Sea who Grant um, engages uh, with. The, there are 650 extension professionals in our network, uh, the Sea Grant network with different um, skill sets that they bring to bear. Many are able to do many things. Um, but amongst all the programs, we it's not 650 full-time, but it is uh, probably 400 full-time equivalents of people working uh, on Sea Grant activities. And they're really the workhorse of, of the programs. Um, I'm gonna skip over a few things I was gonna talk about because I think that the programs are gonna talk about the, a lot of the work that they do, but there's some uh, terrific um, just work that they've already described at a high level in, uh, the four focus areas we have, which is uh, healthy coastal ecosystems, uh, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, uh, the environmental uh, education and workforce development and co um, community re resilience and, and economies. What I will um, all but leave us with on this, Maya, is just uh, if I can total up, and it's what it's things that we're proud of, but at the national office, we we have uh, a mix of different expertise around the program areas. But we each year on an annual basis, and I'm rounding the numbers a little, um, the programs report and we collate that. We support over 900 graduate students and 1,200 researchers in any one year, Sea Grant does. Um, there's a more than 450 peer reviewed publications going into the scientific literature each year uh, because of Sea Grant activities. Uh, we work with partners to protect and restore over 1.5 million um, acres of um, ha coastal habitats uh, from wetlands to coral reefs and the rest each year. Uh, we have um, nearly 4,000 resource managers around the country who are applying um, their different techniques that have been developed in ecosystem-based management because of the work of our extension agents. Uh, there are 12,000 fishers a year who are impacted and work with Sea Grant fisheries extension folks uh, to adopt safe and sustainable fishing practices 
only two more. Uh, we work with um, over 250 uh, coastal communities and um, hazard resilience activities. Um, and we get, engage um, well over 900,000 K through 12 students each year. So while well, Grant, I'll talk about later, isn't the biggest program in the federal network, the engagement activities, the work we do in the coast, focused in the coastal zones um, is uh, pretty impressive from my view, from where I, where I am at, at the National Sea Grant office level. Um, I'll end with um, just one thing that uh, I was in Hawaii, probably the last trip, professional trip I got to take before um, uh, the pandemic uh, started and got to go um, out with one of Darren's uh, extension education uh, specialists, Knessa Duncan uh, Serafin um, from Hawaii Sea Grant. She produces uh, and hosts the Voice of the Sea a uh, television series that describes, uh, and she describes her work for the oceans as the ocean is our source of life, recreation, culture, and discovery. Um, we help share the stories of experts throughout the Pacific region and beyond, uh, connecting communities of residents, educators, learners, researchers, and visitors. And I think while we may not be able to say that as eloquently, that you can multiply by 34 programs um, in the types of work that Sea Grant is most proud of. Um, so I'll turn it back to you, Maya, for now, and um, we can get on with it. Thanks, John. Yeah, so it sounds like Sea Grant programs all across the country are helping to connect those dots, working closely with uh, scientific researchers, but also with folks in the community and students. Um, I love all these statistics you shared, super impressive to hear them all compiled and put together. Um, I'd like to direct this next question um, to our Sea Grant directors and associate directors from the island programs. So this question is for Fran, Darren, and Chapa. Uh, and the question is about the unique perspective and work of Sea Grant programs in island communities. So. Um, can you tell us more about the actual work that you're engaged in um, within island communities? Maybe you have examples of how these island programs have collaborated with one another. And then the second part of the question is, um, are there any lessons from the island communities that Sea Grant works with, from projects that island programs have carried out, Sea Grant island programs have carried out, are there any lessons from these island programs that um, can be applied to other coastal communities in non-island settings. So let's start with Fran first. Can you tell us more about, um, yeah, the unique work that's happening within island programs in the Sea Grant Network? Thank you, Maya. Uh, islands on their own are unique and the work that they do, because even though we're um, oceans apart, uh, we mostly share the same uh, resource management issues, for example. Um, but we find different ways to um, address these problems. So in Guam, uh, just to touch on one of our projects, um, the GROW, um, the balance in the upper watershed that we're working in are presumed to have a major impact on the degradation of the Ugam River water quality as well as its coastal environment. Um, and the Ugam uh, River supplies drinking water to most of Southern Guam. So over at Sea Grant and in partnership with the uh, UOG Marine Lab, we are monitoring the water quality in the area and conducting ecological assessments adjacent to those streams to understand the health of our reefs and kind of link those two together. Um, this way we're able to identify and um, employ the proper management actions to take in the upper uh, watershed. Also, the work we do in our in our grow project uh, is to revegetate areas uh, in that watershed with the help of uh, the community so that they have some ownership in the project and then they understand what's happening in their watershed. And we use native plants and new innovative techniques such as a drone to disperse the seeds in um, the hard to reach areas. Um, and in the past few months during our trial phase of the, the drone technique, um, we were able to disperse like 30,000 seeds, which was kind of a, a you know, amazing. <laughs> so we're looking forward to this summer uh, when it's uh, wet and rainy um, to try uh, dispersing more seeds. 
Um, so these types of um, management actions can be adopted by uh, other islands and then you build island resilience by addressing these threats. Um, so while it is important to build island and coastal resilience, I think it is equally important to build community resilience. And that is what I offer to non-island um, coastal communities. Because I feel like uh, communities really need to have the ability to uh, withstand, adapt, and uh, recover from adversity. And that is why our um, education and outreach program uh, or the work that we do to bring science-based information to our communities is very important. So non-island coastal communities, uh, they experience storms, flooding, and sea level rise, just like we do. Um, so I think now is the time to continue to build that, um, that island resilience, that resilience, community resilience, sorry. Thanks, Fran. Yeah, that's a good lesson for all of us to build community resilience at the local level and to keep building up and out. That's that's a great lesson. Let's move to um, Darren Lerner next. Can you share a little bit about um, the work that your program is doing with island communities? Yeah, thanks, Maya. And thanks, Fran. I really appreciate that um, perspective. It's really just kind of, it's just spot on. And uh, I guess that's why it's so easy to work together, our programs, right? Because we we kind of have that common understanding. Um, yeah, you know, picking particular projects to talk about. We have, uh, at Hawaii Sea Grant, we have 48 faculty and staff uh, and a lot of different projects going on across those focus areas. Um, I want to mention, as as was shared in the chat too, we, we have full-time folks that are that uh, uh, live, work, and play, as we say, uh, outside of Hawaii as well. So we have our faculty on all the main Hawaiian islands. And then we have uh, someone full-time, Kelly Anderson Tagarino in American Samoa. And um, well, normally we have Max Sidnowski in Majuro. He's, uh, he's found himself outside the borders as, as COVID and the pandemic hit. And, and he's been stranded, if you will, in Honolulu ever since, waiting for the opportunity to go home. Um, if I have to pick uh, at least one thing to share, I guess that is like one of kind of a, a little bit newer for our program and something that is, you know, kind of far reaching across the state. I would have to say it's with, with regard to the work that we're doing uh, related to the cesspool issue here in Hawaii. Uh, and we've been learning a lot of lessons from, from other programs and other states in the United States, et, et cetera, on the continent. Um, but a, a handful of it. So first of all, if you don't know, Hawaii has the proud, I'm kidding, that's sarcasm. We're not so proud of the fact that we have more cesspools in our state than any other US state or territory. Yay, not really, 88,000. Uh, and uh, quite a bit of them are either located on the on Hawaii Island, often referred to as the Big Island, or Oahu. And um, it's a really significant problem, as I'm sure it's not hard to imagine when you have that number of cesspools, uh, so many of which, remember what I said before, everything is coastal. So they're all in the coastal zone. And if they're not... Um, having impacts in the near shore environment and, and here on the Hawaiian islands, and I think similar to many of the high islands anyways, across the Pacific and the Atlantic, you know, across all oceans, um, we don't have the big stream-based watersheds that like the continental US has, right? So a lot of that freshwater input into our near shore is, is through submarine groundwater discharge and it comes bubbling up in those near shore environments and it's quite variable and, and widespread. Uh, and so when you then add to that picture uh, a very significant number of cesspools uh, and that, you know, of course the nature of a cesspool is it's supposed to use the ground to filter and clean the water that's in that content. Uh, but unfortunately with short distances and that kind of exposure so close to the near shore, you end up with a lot of increased nutrients in that near shore environment, which have all sorts of implications for, for marine life, both plant and animal based marine life in that environment. And even those that are located kind of more upland uh, still can find pretty immediate access to groundwater supplies, 
And another difference, I think, or commonality among our high islands and difference to a lot of our colleagues and friends on, on continental masses like the United States is uh, we're very heavily dependent on groundwater for our drinking water. Uh, whereas a lot of other locations might rely either equally or even more so on surface water than groundwater. Um, so the implications for cesspool contaminants and increased nutrients in groundwater is very significant. Uh, and a handful of years ago, you know, COVID, you start to lose track of time. It's been a very long year. I'm going to go with four. Uh, our government decided we really need to do something about this. And the governor declared and the state declared that we're going to have to have a solution on the table. And we've got to get rid of all these cesspools. We've got to convert them all by 2050, which is an extremely heavy lift. It's a multi-trillion dollar problem. And one of the first things uh, when the governor set up a task force for which our Sea Grant program and our Water Resources Research Institute at the University of Hawaii are both involved among many other partners. One of the first things we came to is, A, you're just not gonna be able to get that done in that time frame, And B, the biggest problem why is the cost. Uh, because so many in our community just simply can't afford to go out tomorrow and convert these cesspools, even if they want to, uh, to some other uh, method. Of course, the, the first go-to is septic, uh, which is another issue and we won't have time to talk about today, but is not always the answer if you'll just take that as the answer on that. Um, but we're talking upward of anywhere between 50 and $30,000 for these conversions. So it, it's really a, it's a, a multi-pronged, not only environmental, but also social and economic uh, problem for our communities and our people here in the islands here in Hawaii in particular, as an example of some of the work we do. And I think it's a great exemplar for how Sea Grant doesn't just, remember we talked about fish grant, we don't just work uh, directly in the ocean, for instance, and we don't work in a kind of a, in, in approaches that are singular in their discipline. The problems that we try to tackle as Sea Grant programs on our coasts and oceans uh, are so-called wicked problems and they take multi and inter and transdisciplinary approaches to really come up with solutions. Uh, and I wasn't watching my time, Maya, but I think I'll stop there and hand the mic back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. Um, that's a great example of how Sea Grant helps to stitch the different pieces together and complete applied research in an island context. Let's hear from Chapa. Chapa, do you have any examples of how you've collaborated with other island programs or lessons from Puerto Rico Sea Grant that you hope other coastal communities can apply and learn from? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, the way that, that our program has dealt with the issue of climate change and extreme weather events uh, was very significant after the impact of hurricanes Irma and Maria. Uh, when, when you have the impact of such a, a big event, you know, you, you don't notice that because, for example, after the first half an hour, we didn't have any electricity. We didn't have any water, running water. We didn't have any communications. And we thought, well, you know, this is a hurricane. That's what it is. Uh, but the hurricane had strong winds, a lot of rain, uh, and it lasted 27 hours over Puerto Rico. So when, when you realize that you open your doors and your windows and all the trees are down, uh, neighbors start coming out. You say, you know, we have been educating Puerto Rico's coastal residents and, and everybody about resiliency. And we started about two years before the Irma and Maria collaborating with NDPTC, which is the national Disaster Training Center uh, program 
And that was a collaboration with Hawaii Sea Grant that they made the connection and we started collaborating and bringing people from Hawaii to Puerto Rico to offer some of the workshops for first responders, for engineers, for uh, different uh, municipal employees and government employees. So we were educating before the event and that was very helpful for us. We also had a big uh, collaboration with NOAA Coastal Services, and we also shared some of their expertise with our uh, first responders. Uh, they conducted workshops about flood maps, about uh, what to do during the hurricane and after the hurricane. And, you know, we have been telling people if we ever get hit by a hurricane five or four, category four hurricane, we're gonna be one year without electricity. And you know, we were six months without electricity, without running water, and two months without telephones. And I don't know if you can imagine life like that. And we could survive because we are very resilient because culturally, people from the islands had that experience and they were taught by their grandfathers, their grandmothers, their fathers, uh, that when we have a hurricane, you have to help your neighbors. So right after the hurricane, we, are, we go out, we start cleaning the roads from trees, we start visiting old people, looking after our neighbors. And that is really what resiliency is all about. You have to be prepared and know that you have to help your friends. Then we receive help from the diaspora. We receive uh, help from the federal government. Sigrant started helping in the development of inventories about the destruction of the fishing villages, uh, how, about the loss of equipment of the fishermen. We help the fishermen with food, with a new equipment because they could not fish. There was no electricity, no ice, no running water, no gasoline. So, so that is when you really realize that the effort that you make to educate people really has a difference. And having collaborated with Hawaii Sea Grant and, and NDPTC and NOAA Coastal Services was very good for us since we educated first responders, engineers, and people knew what they had to do. Wow, Chapa, that's a great lesson for us to carry with us past this panel that um, community resilience is relationship based in relationships and friends, neighbors, family, those are gonna be the first responders um, and the, the safety net in these extreme events. Mahalo for sharing that. I see a number of questions coming in through the chat and um, some questions related to the work that Sea Grant programs have been involved in with um, international groups. Um, and I actually see that Mr. Masanori Kobayashi from the Sasakawa Peace Foundation is also in this session. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, we can have Mr. Masanori join us a uh, special cameo on the panel this morning. And as we're getting close to kind of the end of the panel, um, I'd like for all the panelists and um, Mr. Kobayashi as well to talk a little bit about how the younger generation um, can begin to engage in ocean science, in community resilience, all the things that we've been talking about in the, the panel this morning. Um, you know, earlier, John kind of uh, mentioned this, this call to action or this call to innovation, call to collaboration for the next generation. So if, uh, I'd like to end on that note. How can the younger generation step up and get involved in? Are there ways for young people to um, connect through uh, sea grant programs within um, island communities? So um, let's actually, we'll go back to John and then we'll circle through the panelists. 
Yeah, thanks, Maya. We'll keep these, it, it, we'll keep these remarks I, brief because we are close to the end of the, the panel. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short. I think, you know, some of it is through at the early ages, it's through just the touch base with the environment itself. I mean, it's local, it's parents, it's colleagues. Sea Grant plays a role in that at the, in the schools in particular and in informal education. Um, I think it is really engaging in the STEM activities, the science and engineering, math activities, uh, for those who are interested in the, in the hard sciences. Uh, and Sea Grant provides those opportunities that those, that a path that, um, to follow. We're not the only answer, it's through partners that we uh, work and do, and do that. And then uh, really Nicole yesterday was sort of the exemplar of how that can happen. It's engagement, it's passion. Um, to follow your dreams and, and try to set those. And I think we try to help people follow their dreams um, as, as they're going through their early years and then on when it, when it works out that way into the college realm. So I'll let others speak as well. Thank you. Let's, um, let's go to Darren Lerner next. How can young people stay engaged with ocean science and uh, you know island resilience? Yeah, thanks, Maya. As you said, I'll keep it brief. I see the, the clock ticking here. I mean, you know, first and foremost is their own interest, of course. And, um, you know, for Sea Grant programs, um, and, and as I, I kind of began with earlier, the, the, our work and our efforts, are, they're just all about people and the development of tomorrow's workforce. Um, and so, you know, we, I'm not saying we have it perfect, but I think we're all striving to create the programs and the pathways um, for in, the engagement of young people who have interest in working in these fields that are related to our programs. Uh, and, it, and it's just, it's wide ranging from formal education programs on our university campuses to those that go out into the community and, and do workshops and teach community groups and you know, open informational workshops to the public, uh, to formal fellowships and summer undergrad, uh, undergrad research experiences and on and on. Uh, again, I, I, I know we don't have it perfect, but I think collectively, and we do so much to look towards the other programs, you know, as I'm sitting here, I can say the other 33 programs to learn about their best practices and, you know, no good idea goes unstolen across the Sea Grant network, right? We take our good ideas and we share them among ourselves. Uh, and again, if there's there's any priority, it is on uh, the students and, and young individuals who are looking to get into these fields and be engaged. Thanks, Darren. Let's move to Mr. Kobayashi. How can the next generation get involved? Thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful- The comment is brief. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think it's good to uh, share the, the problems uh, that are visible in our communities. I think uh, young people are more sensitive to the marine plastic issues, but also the disappearance of seagrass due to the uh, water warping. So it's good to share the problems that are visible and to try to think about the solutions that are not necessarily available immediately, but uh, it's good to think about it as the collective actions for the current and the future generation. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear from Chapa. How can the next generation get involved? Well, you know, I have <clears throat> great faith in, in our younger generation. I see uh, students <clears throat> that are very interested in conservation of resources. And I just wish that we have more opportunities for them in Puerto Rico, for example, Sea Grant is one of the biggest providers of opportunities uh, for volunteerism, for working on, on projects uh, in undergraduate or graduate school. And I'm looking forward to providing more opportunities for our younger generation, which I admire. And I know that I have all the hope that they will try to solve the problems of the world and make this a better place to live. Mahalo, Chapa. And last but not least, let's hear from Fran. How can students in Guam get involved? Fran, I think your um, microphone might be muted. Got it. <laughs> uh, I think the youth uh, groups are very important to engage because they're the ones that are going to be here like after we're gone. 
And so yesterday, Nicole Yamasi, our keynote speaker, was uh, advocating to provide more opportunities for young adults so they can contribute to the movement. And uh, we are all already doing this through our internships and our fellowships, um, but we just need to continue to foster these young individuals um, who are passionate and motivated to, to do this kind of work. Um, on Guam, for example, um, there's a youth network called Us for Guam that was just recently formed. And uh, it was formed to engage youth in the environment and they are just like filled with all these great ideas. So let's continue to support them. Thank you. A huge thank you, mahalo to all of our panelists for sharing um, their thoughts, their ideas with us. And thank you to the audience for, for watching the panel this morning. I'll hand it back to Phil and the team with the Conference for Island Sustainability. Sidurus, Maasi, Maya, and panelists for highlighting the role Sea Grant plays in the islands. Mm -hmm.